So you want to climb outside, but you don't know how to get started. In this video, I'm going to be covering how to find outdoor bouldering, top roping, and sport climbing, as well as all the gear and knowledge that you'll need to get started climbing outdoors. All this is based off my experience over the past three years climbing outside, but warning, I'm not a guide or certified in any of this stuff, so don't go outside based only on what I'm saying here, then get hurt and blame it on me. Make sure that you stick around till the end of the video because I'm going to be answering some subscriber questions about climbing outdoors, as as well as giving you a few tips and tricks about climbing outside that you might not have thought of. First thing is you need to figure out where you want to climb. Outdoor climbing areas are called crags. Sometimes there's only one crag, sometimes there's multiple crags within a climbing area. It just depends on how big the area is. My favorite way to find climbs outdoors near me is to use an app called Mountain Project. Mountain Project is a free app that is also available as a regular website on a computer. It tells you area-specific information like driving and hiking directions, rules and regulations, and places to eat and camp. You can make an account on Mountain Project and find crags located near you. Where you're going to climb is going to depend a lot on how much you want to drive, what grades you're looking for, and what style of climbing you're looking to do. A great way to find routes or problems is to use the Route Finder tool. Simply tap Route Finder, select the type of rock climbing you are doing, and the grade range you are looking for. I always like to group by area so you can see how many routes in your grade range are at a certain crag. Mountain Project is a great resource, but you can also find outdoor climbs by talking to the staff at your local gym, buying a guidebook for the specific area you're looking to climb in, or joining climbing groups online. Some areas are far better navigated by a guidebook than Mountain Project, but it really just depends on where you're looking to climb. Sometimes Mountain Project will even list specific guidebooks for the area that you're looking to climb in. Once you've picked an area to climb in, you're going to need to look at gear. The gear that you need is going to vary greatly depending on which crag and what style of climbing that you're looking to do, but I'll be leaving links to all the gear that I'm talking about today in the description below. The main things that you're going to need no matter what style of climbing you're doing are chalk, a chalk bag, and climbing shoes. Okay, let's break it down into what gear that you'll need for bouldering, top roping, and lead climbing also known as sport climbing. If you're bouldering, you're going to need a crash pad. Crash pads come in a variety of different brands and sizes. They have backpack straps and you carry the crash pad in wherever you're climbing, just like you would a backpack. I use the Metolius Recon Trifold crash pad because I really like that it's lightweight, it has pockets to keep snacks and camera gear, and it also has a pretty big surface area for when you fall. Okay, let's talk top rope. If you're top roping, the main thing that you're going to need is a dynamic rope. The length of the rope really depends on wherever you're climbing. It's pretty standard to get a 70 meter rope, but if you're climbing in areas where you might not be climbing such tall things, you might be able to get away with a 60 or even a 40 meter rope. It really just depends on where you're looking to climb. You can find the height of the routes you want to climb on Mountain Project next to the route names. If you're top roping, you're also going to need something to create top rope anchors with. Tubular webbing is commonly used for this. How much tubular webbing you're going to need is really going to depend on the area. You also need three locking carabiners, two to help set the top rope anchors and one for your belay device. Which, speaking of which, you're going to need a belay device, such as an ATC or a Grigri. You will also need a harness for both you and your partner. It's also a good idea to get some sort of safety leash or a little bit of extra tubular webbing to create a personal safety leash when you're setting the top rope anchors just in case you were to like slip and you're at the top of the cliff, you're tied in still somehow. It's not required, but a rope bag or even just a cheap tarp is a really good way to help keep your rope clean. A dirty rope is a lot less safe than a clean rope because that dirt and grime can weaken the rope and make it not last as long over time. It can also get stuck in your belay device and cause it to not function as smoothly. I also am going to highly, highly recommend that both you and your partner wear a helmet. Helmets are largely a personal decision, but because I care about your safety, I'm going to urge you, please wear a helmet. I don't want to see you get hurt. Okay, so if you want to lead climb outdoors, you're going to need all the same gear as you would for top roping, except you won't need tubular webbing because you won't be setting top rope anchors. 
The main thing that you're going to need is quick draws. Quick draws come in packs of six. If you're climbing things that are less than four bolts, you might be able to get away with one pack of six quick draws. But my personal recommendation would be to get two packs or 12 quick draws in total, and that's a good place to get started. You're also going to need cleaning gear. Cleaning is something that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later in this video, but the gear that you'll need for it includes some sort of personal anchor system, or PAS, as well as three locking carabiners. Another really helpful item if you are going out to lead climb is called a stick clip, or some people call it a clip stick. The most common type of stick clip is the super clip, and basically it's a little device that attaches to the top of a standard painter's pole and is used to clip the first bolt on a route so that you don't fall before you're attached to the wall. Okay, so you found your climbs and you have all your gear, what's next? The most important thing that you're going to need before you climb outside is knowledge. There are two main types of knowledge that you're going to need. Number one is etiquette knowledge, and number two is hands-on knowledge. I'm going to give you the basics of both etiquette knowledge and hands-on knowledge, but especially for hands-on knowledge, I can't give you everything that you're going to need to know because I'm not a guide, I'm not certified. These are things that you're going to have to learn from experienced climbers in person, uh, take a class, or read a book watch the list of videos that I'm going to be leaving in the description, but please, before you go outside, make sure that you have all the etiquette knowledge and hands-on knowledge that you can to climb safely and properly. Etiquette knowledge is basically how to be respectful of the people and places while you're climbing outdoors. Etiquette knowledge includes things like leave no trace principles, which in a nutshell is making sure that you stay on trails, don't take things from nature home with you, and pack all your trash or any other items that you brought in with you back out when you go. This is essential if we want to keep having nice outdoor climbing areas. When you climb outside, make sure to keep your music and talking at a low volume so that climbers and belayers can communicate safely and effectively. If you're using chalk, make sure to brush any tick marks that you're making off the climb after you're done climbing. Lastly, try to keep your personal belongings contained to one specific area and as much off the trail as possible so that people can walk around freely. Okay, so now let's talk about hands-on knowledge. For bouldering outdoors, there's not really any extra hands-on knowledge that you're going to need to know climbing outside compared to climbing inside. Just make sure that you're a little bit more cognizant of spotting each other and know that, you know, if you don't land on your crash pad, you're going to be landing on the ground. If you're top roping, you're going to need to know how to set a top rope anchor. Keep in mind that not all crags have the ability to set top rope anchors. Some crags are lead climbing crags only, so make sure to check that before you go out to climb if you only know how to top rope and not how to lead. The way that you can check that is if you go on Mountain Project and you look for the routes that you want to climb, there should be a little TR next to the route that you're looking to climb, and that means that it's top rope friendly. And then obviously you also need to know how to top rope climb and top rope belay. Okay, so for lead climbing, you're going to need to know how to lead climb and lead belay. You're also going to need to know how to clean. Cleaning is the process of getting your gear back off the wall after you're done climbing on your way down. For lead climbing, you're also going to need to know how to use a clip stick to clip that first bolt like we talked about earlier. So for hands-on knowledge, you're going to be able to learn a lot of this stuff by taking a gym to crag class at a local climbing gym, learning from an experienced climber, and also supplementing these things these hands-on experiences with videos and books, which I'll link to a few in the description. So that's pretty much the basics of climbing outside, but now I'm going to give you a few tips and tricks and things that you might not have thought of, as well as answer some questions I have from subscribers about climbing outdoors. So something that I think is really different about climbing outdoors than climbing indoors is that you actually have to find the route. Indoors, it's like, ah, oh, there's that pink problem, uh, there's all the pink holds, I'm gonna go climb it. 
outdoors, it's like, is this the climb? I think it's the climb. How do we figure that out? So one thing that I do when I'm trying to find a specific route is to look at any photos and find any identifying features on the route itself, like an overhanging roof or a prominent feature like a crack or a change in coloration in the rock. You can also identify certain things on the route like boulders or trees that might be helpful in finding the climb. Another thing you can do is count bolts. Based on photos and counting bolts, you can usually match up at least one route in the area to a name and mountain project or your guidebook. Then you can use this route as a waypoint and determine how many routes should be between the route you found and the route you are looking for based on the information in Mountain Project or your guidebook. Keep in mind if there are any trad routes listed, these aren't going to have bolts, so they shouldn't be counted in between when you're trying to find the route that you're looking for. Another thing that I don't think is talked about nearly enough is bringing enough food, water, and clothing when you go outside to climb for your first time. We have brought so many people climbing for the first time that have been hungry, thirsty, or cold because they haven't brought the proper amount of one of these three items. So make sure that you're throwing enough food into your backpack for the day. I usually bring about a half gallon of water, but that is obviously a personal preference. And then bring layers, right? So you can wear a jacket that you have and you can take that jacket off when you're climbing if you get too hot, but you can't wear a jacket that you don't have. Another thing that you can do to stay warm if it's cold at the crag is bring hand warmers and bring hot beverages. We actually have an electric hand warmer that doubles as like a portable phone charger that's been really helpful and has came in clutch on those cold days. Okay, so let me answer a few questions from subscribers about outdoor climbing before we round out the end of this video. Coaster B1 asks, as a highly sensitive person, I'm curious how easily you adjust from climbing indoor holds to real outdoors. So honestly, real rock can be quite a bit more rough on your hands than climbing indoors on plastic holds. But the nice part about outdoors is that compared to indoors, everything is on on an outdoor route. So you can use whatever you want to climb. Whereas indoors, you know, there's specific features or volumes or holds that are on or off, depending on what the setter is intended. But overall, climbing outside just takes a little bit more experience to figure out how to find holds, how to find where to put your hands, where to put your feet. But over time, you get used to it. And I don't know, I really like climbing both indoors and outdoors, but they are very different experiences. So Sydney asked, how do you prevent injuries? Sometimes injuries happen even if you're well prepared, but with the right gear and the right knowledge, you can minimize a lot of the risks of injury that you'll find in outdoor climbing. The three main things that I would say are easy ways to minimize risk when you're climbing outdoors is number one, wear a helmet. Number two, use a stick clip. And number three, make sure that you're climbing within a grade range that you're comfortable with. Don't go outdoors for your first time and try to climb at your absolute max limit. Like ease yourself into it, get a little bit more comfortable with it, and then you can push your grade range. Ready Ames Flyer asked, I've climbed outdoors a few times, but I would love to know how do you deal with the fear? I begin to freak out when I'm not even a foot off the ground. For me, a lot of my fear comes from being worried that when I fall, I'm going to get injured. So I know things that I've done in the past is when I get really scared, I've started to talk to myself out loud and said things like, you're okay, because that tells my brain, like, you're okay, even if you fall, it's, it's not very likely that you're going to get hurt. So you're okay, that's what I told myself. I also have told myself specific actions that I can take to put myself in a better position so as to not fall. So for example, if I can see any sort of hand or foot or hip movement that I can do to adjust my body, I've been like, out loud said, move your right hand to that crimp, move your right hand to that crimp. And when you do that, then let, like, let's look at the next step of what we need to do after that. But first, just move your right hand to that crimp. Um, fear falling, honestly, is something that I'm still really working on. So I guess my best advice is to be 
patient with yourself and realize that it's completely normal to have these fears, right? Like your body is trying to keep you alive. Like any skill or improvement that you're trying to make, fear of falling is something that's just going to get better with a lot of practice, right? I think something that really resonated with me one time is that my climbing partner told me, you can't be brave if you're not scared. And that's just something that I always try to remember when I'm climbing and I'm scared. You can't be brave if you're not scared. Okay, if you have any more questions about outdoor climbing, leave them in the comments and I will do my best to answer them. If you are new here, please consider subscribing to the channel, Court Climbs, and you can see all sorts of videos about outdoor climbing, indoor climbing, podcasts, and everything in between. I really am just trying to provide an inclusive space for climbers of all levels and backgrounds to feel like they can get into the sport and have fun and be excited about it. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, stay hyped.